So I wanted to um, talk about something a little bit different, um, hopefully fits with the theme, um, um, also fits with themes about around sustainability and also reflecting on things that perhaps didn't work out in the way that we might have hoped they did at the time um, and what we've learned from that, learning the lessons of things that didn't quite work out. So um, I wanted to my role at CIFA is um, I'm head, head of professional development and practice. I spend a lot of time thinking about the structures that we need um, to develop our practice and our skills now, but also what those structures might look like in the future and, and to try and future proof some of the um, some of the initiatives and the structures we have in place to support our members, to help accredit potential members, new members in the future um, and build uh, that professional network. So. Um, yeah, I spent an awful lot of time putting this presentation together wondering about elephants um, and particularly how, how do you eat an elephant one step at a time, um, which uh, is, is an appropriate um, uh, subtitle, I think, for, for this presentation, I hope. So if you cast your minds back to 2019, um, almost exactly four years ago, we were at um, the CIFA conference in Leeds. We had a, a, a general meeting of members and we put a proposition to the members to give them the opportunity to vote in favour or not of a proposal to develop chartered status for archaeologists. And and we, we didn't win that vote. Um, the members decided not to um, approve that proposition. We needed 75% of voting members to, to vote to approve, which is a very high threshold, but probably appropriate for such an important decision and step forward for the profession. And there were some very um, strong arguments in favour of developing that proposal and taking it forward. And there were some very strong and, and valid reasons why um, people didn't want that to happen at the time and, and issues with the proposal itself and also with the communication around it. Um, we sought a lot of feedback after that. It was something that CIFA's board um, and staff um, were, were generally very supportive of. So it was it was a disappointment, I suppose, to us who'd, who'd worked a long time um, on that proposal. But it also gave us a, a, a really good opportunity to reflect um, on the feedback that we that we sought at the time. And we got a lot of very useful feedback um, from from members. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. We, we did quite a lot of, of, of talking about this at the time four years ago, but there were a lot of reasons why people didn't vote, our members didn't vote in favour of that proposal. Some of them were really nothing to do with the proposal at all, actually, that they, they felt that there were higher priorities that CIFA should be addressing. Um, and some of them were, were really, um, you know, down to the nuts and bolts of the, of the proposal itself, whether it would work, whether we had the resources, whether it was fair, whether it was a good way of um, of, of assessing uh, competence and promoting competence, and whether um, people might get le left behind in that in that promotion of a of a, a chartered um, a chartered status, and I think I think if if we're honest and and looking at some of the feedback, there was also a little bit of pushback um, on on CIFA really, and and some feedback that that perhaps some of our members didn't quite trust the motivations behind the proposal, um, didn't quite feel that they'd been involved in the way that they would have liked to have been in developing that proposal and didn't feel that they were having their say on a whole range of issues actually, not just to do the chartered status. So we've thought an awful lot about that over the last four years and I, what I wanted to do just um, this afternoon is, is just tell you a little bit about what we've done in response to that feedback to the, the, the non-chartered archaeologist related issues and, and our, our proposals for for, for moving forward and how, how we develop from there. Um, so just to start with the higher priorities really that, that, that we uh, had feedback from members that they would prefer us to be concentrating on. Um, equality, diversity and inclusion was the big one. Um, a lot of people felt that, that there were such big issues in terms of, of equity, um, lack of diversity in, in archaeology that that it was the wrong time to be thinking about chartered status. We really needed to tackle that first. Um, there were issues about the way that we promote the value of archaeology at the moment and a lack, I think, probably of a shared understanding. A lot of people have talked um, uh, already today and, and throughout the conference about working in the public interest and public value and, and public benefit. And I don't think that we had, even four years ago, that shared understanding of what we thought the value of archaeology was and how that was, was articulated. And there was a lot of feedback about a lack of promotion of um, 
professional archaeologists and, and issues with structures that we have in place to regulate ourselves as a profession, whether CIF is doing enough to, to police the sector, whether the standards that we have are effective, whether the mechanisms that we have in place for um, creating those standards and then enforcing those standards are actually, are actually working. Um, so those were, were issues that came back to us in feedback. Um, if we have a look at some of those in a bit more detail, equality, diversity and inclusion. And I don't want to in any way sound complacent about any of this, although, right, we've done that tick job done. These are all big issues and, and very much works in progress. But there has been some progress made, I think, um, from, from that point. So we now have an EDI champion on the board. Um, CIFA's board of directors. It may not sound very much, but actually, if you heard Penn Foreman talking in the opening address, she's making a huge difference. Um, and that has the potential um, to see uh, it. The moment that difference is in to do with the board's focus and attention on these issues, but that will translate into action, which will tra translate into change um, before too long, I think. Um, there's an EDI advisory committee that came into being, it came from the special interest group, but that in itself, I mean, it's terminology, but taking EDI issues away from being a special interest group to being a standing committee that's there to advise our board of directors and to shape CIFA policy around EDI, I think, again, has been a huge, a huge step forward. Um, in terms of our own governance structures, we are working towards this um, pro progression framework model, which is something that comes from um, the Engineering Council way. As an institution ourselves, we can measure ourselves against um, key indicators to see where we score at the moment in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, and then to set targets for where we want to get to. So we have a mechanism in place to measure ourselves as an organisation um, in our governance structures, in our staffing, in our committees and all the rest of it. Um, and as, as Penn mentioned um, yesterday morning, we've um, been funded by Historic England to carry out some research into barriers um, to um, entering into archaeology, to staying within archaeology across the whole range of, of protected characteristics. And that's raised some wider issues as well beyond protected characteristics about the sustainability of, of careers in archaeology, um, which um, is, is, is probably something that we're all of aware of anecdotally but it's good to have have that 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 data in place so some progress there uh promoting the value of archaeology again a lot of work um around this and working with the client sector and with the um, uh, allied professional bodies to promote the value of what our members our members do so again um a lot of work around public benefit and tom mentioned the, the the practice paper but also working with um colleagues like sadie watson and her research project and trying to support and partner with with organizations who are who are looking at this and and doing this in in practice um the syria guide uh, again there was a plug for the syria guide um construction industry research um, an information association. It's a, a guide that's used by our construction um, sector and uh, the good practice guide was written by um, Mola ourselves and Taryn Nixon. It was an updated version um, and it's brought the language up to date. I'm contractually obliged to tell you that there is a 20% discount <laughs> if you order your copy at the conference. Um, it's not... <laughs> it's not aimed at you as archaeologists necessarily, it's aimed at your clients and the people that you work with, but it's really useful for you to have those copies and know what that guide is is is, um, is telling your clients they should expect of you um, working on those projects. I'm going to rush through this now. Um, a lot of external comms and advocacy, which my colleague Rob Lennox um, has talked about more about in, in other formats promoting the value of archaeology and supporting UKRI research projects. And again, I mentioned Sadie's, Sadie's work, doing what we can to support those, those projects. Um, and again, on strengthening the structures that we have in place to promote professionalism and self-regulation, major review of the code of conduct going on at the moment. And I'm hoping that you will all engage in that. Um, Peter Hinton was talking about that earlier on. Um, looking in huge detail at our standards and guidance and how they work as documents and involving you as practitioners and the end users of those standards and guidance in that process. Um, and as always, promoting um, the importance of accredited 
professionals and registered organisations to the client sector. So um, elephant in the room, we haven't made much progress on playing conditions in archaeology, I think it has to be said, and on the promotion of sustainable and equitable careers. That is still a huge issue. Um, not, it's not a CIFA issue, it's a discipline-wide issue, but it's something that came back very strongly, obviously, in the feedback um, around that chartered archaeologist vote. So the other thing that we've been doing is trying to align our structures with other professions. So in the absence of being able to say that we can convert chartered status on archaeologists, what we do is we tell uh, people who ask us that our MCFAs are the equivalent of chartered professionals in other industries. Um, but we need to make sure that that's actually true and that we're aligning our structures um, for accrediting professionalism with the professions that, that you as our members work alongside. So that is the aim in our strategic plan to give archaeologists um, a status equivalent to that of a chartered profession um, at this stage. And we've done that by bringing in um, a number of, of changes to the process for accrediting co um, competence. So uh, assessment of ethical competence at all grades of membership, which again was feedback that we got from the chartered archaeologist vote. Um, whereby people felt that conferring chartered status might mean that other grades of accreditation were not seen as practicing ethically. So we brought that in. We brought in a professional review interview for applicants for MCFA, where we can really explore ethical competence and through discussion um, with applicants um, and provision of resources, which again, um, Peter Hinton went through in the um, opening address that are all available on the website to support that development of ethical competence and actually get us talking a little bit more about professional ethics and what that means, what ethical behaviour looks like and ethical decision making looks like in the real world um, outside the sort of theor theory of the overarching um, code of conduct. So a few more bites out of the elephant. Um, but what's the point of all this? As I suddenly wondered to myself on the train, I spent an awful lot of time trying to produce a graphic that took bites out of an elephant. Um, <laughs> but why am I actually telling you all of this? And I think the point that I wanted to make really is that in order to achieve a sustainable future for our profession, which I'm sure is what we all want to do, we, pro we need something that changes the narrative actually, that, that allows us to, to um, articulate that value to, to clients, to the public, and probably most importantly to ourselves. Now we can do all that without chartered status. We don't need to call ourselves chartered archaeologists to do that. But if we're not all doing it now, we need something that changes the narrative so that we raise the expectations that clients have of us as archaeologists, that the public have of us as archaeologists, but also the expectations, the aspirations that we have of ourselves. Um, and the aspirations and expectations that you have from your institutions like CIFA and like other bodies that are involved in this. So I think chartered status is one way that we can achieve that sustainable future. Um, it is something that at some point we will be bringing to another vote. Um, but at this time, what we'd like to do is develop a model that more people feel that they aligns with their values and that they can buy into um, and I will leave it there. Thank you very much.